Um, welcome everyone to our lightning talks on teaching through experiential learning. My name is Ben Keating. I'm assistant director at the Center for Teaching and Learning at BU, and I'm truly thrilled and honored to be here with you today. We have an amazing group of faculty from across the university and across disciplines to speak today about experiential learning. I want to mention quickly that our speakers were part of a faculty fellows program called Bridge Builders, funded by a grant from the Davis Foundation and run by the CTL and BU's Initiative on Cities program. Uh, resources on experiential learning or EL that grew out of the program will soon appear on CTL's website. Um, the session is sponsored by the Center for Teaching and Learning and the uh, Digital Learning and Innovation at BU. I want to I want to thank the teams from DLNI and CTL for their their help organizing and running this event. Sam McChris and Cindy, Cindy Vincent from DLNI, and Etienne Wasson and Deb Breen from CTL. Before we get underway, um, here are two quick announcements. So we have five faculty speakers today. They'll each have five minutes. And then after these five lightning talks, we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, as we go, we encourage everyone to use the chat, speakers included, to ask questions and make comments. And we'll come back to those chat comments and questions during the Q&A. Um, today's session will be recorded, and the captioned recording will be available soon on the DLNI website. There's an entire bank of lightning talks across a, a huge variety of subjects. Um, we've also enabled live transcription, so you'll see it in your toolbar with the CC icon. Um, next slide. Oh, yes, next slide, please. Recording, next slide. Q&A, next slide. Okay. Um, I would like to introduce our moderator, Aaron Salius. Aaron Salius is the inaugural director of the Experiential Learning Connector, a resource for CAS undergraduates that promotes awareness about and access to EL. Aaron is an alum of the BU Arts and, Sci of BU Arts and Sciences, having earned her doctorate in English from GRS in 2015. Her scholarship focuses on contemporary African-American literature and religion. Prior to joining the Connector, she served as Associate Dean in Metropolitan College and the Director of Summer Term at BU. Thank you, Aaron, for moderating. Now let me hand it over to Aaron to let, get us going. Thank you, Ben. Um, and welcome, everyone, to these lightning talks on teaching through experiential learning. I was truly honored to be asked to moderate today's conversation. And I'm as eager as all of you are to hear from the exceptional faculty members who will be presenting. Since December 2022, as Ben mentioned, I have been working with my colleagues in CAS to launch and develop the Experiential Learning Connector, which is a resource that helps our undergrads find and access experiential learning, or EL as we call it, um, at BU and beyond. The college's decision to create the connector underscores its ongoing commitment to the value of experiential learning. As we see it, EL can be and often is transformative for students. We know that when students apply knowledge and skills from the classroom to real world situations, they thrive and so does the environment around them. The impact of EL is both instantaneous and long lasting. Students who engage in EL discover the breadth and the value of their education and how to leverage it to benefit others. As we at The Connector tell students, there are countless ways to engage with EL at BU. Some examples include mentored research, study away or abroad, service learning, team-based projects, field work, on and off-campus internships. Through these activities, students explore questions that matter and seek solutions to problems that affect us all. What's so exciting about the lightning talks we have today, though, is that these faculty members will be telling us about how they integrate EL directly into their classes, creating opportunities for students to engage in EL alongside and with and through their coursework. As Ben mentioned, we'll hear five lightning talks this hour. Min Ye will discuss ways to think about incorporating EL into course design. Holly Schaff will focus on student reflection. 
Sean Keeley will provide an overview of EL in the BU School of Law. And Max Greenberg will go over best practices in partnering with community members to create EL opportunities for students. And so we're gonna get started with our first talk from Min Ye, who is Professor of International Relations in the Pardee School of Global Studies. Professor Ye, I turn it over to you for designing experiential learning. Well, uh, thank you so much, Erin, uh, for this uh, introduction. I also want to thank the CTO, Ben and Deborah and other staff that have made this two year project so productive and I learned more than I contribute. So that's an that's honest reflection from a participant. And so I'm not an expert on teaching. Uh, I, I, I've been teaching at BU since 2007. So as a scholar, I kind of got a little bit uh, um, bored with the traditional ways of content or scholar academic teaching. So I thought the the um the can I have the my slides please, um yes thank you so much first slides please, um so I thought you know I, the 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 experiential learning which is uh, uh commonly adopted adopted across many fields disciplines you know policy or social science humanities natural science it's just so versatile but it's also very overwhelming so so i thought how could uh, this um thinking about you know designing your course uh, and incorporating el into your course uh manageable from a novice perspective so these few slides are kind of based on my own reflection of what's happening in the policy school, business school, the area that I'm more familiar with, uh, and then the, the different types, uh, and, and, and then the, the step-by-step -step thinking of incorporating uh, EL in your, in, in your course. Uh, and our, my, my colleagues, uh, um, in this same project, they'll get into the much in-depth treatment of application and examples. So, so uh, first, the uh, when we in my case, uh, so I, I thought it would be useful when we decide whether to adopt EL, and we we and to what extent to adopt EL in your course design. Uh, we, we we needed to think about like what purpose does that uh, serve, and so in the uh, social science and policy schools, for example, experiential projects uh, or experiential experience uh, design, they tend to have three types. Uh, the first is to uh, illustrate uh, a theory or a framework for students to um, apply what they learn theoretically into a real world. Uh, but since we can't replicate a lot of real world things, so simulation is often used as well. And the second type that I use a lot in my 500 level class in terms of policy research, that's application. And so you got to apply what you learn into a real world policy debates. Uh, and so, so, so so that's uh, uh, in, in our field, it's a, it's more substantial design than the illustration. And the last sets are most substantial. The whole course or most of course is based on an experience. So internship, capstone, work study, study abroad, those are very commonly used in the social science and policy schools. Next slide, please. So once we kind of feel like what, what the types of um, uh, EL works for your particular course, uh, then, then there are some options um, that you can think about. So for uh, illustration, again, very flexible. It could be minimum to much larger uh, projects, uh, but uh, it's typically a team or, or a individual project. And then we have, um, you know, step by step thinking about it, and the application you have um it, it it's it's typically semester long, uh and uh, it's a staged bigger project, um and the the here instructors are often 
needed to constantly inter, inter, intervene and uh, and uh, provide the feedback. In a uh, uh, practicum, then the whole thing is how you can maintain hands off and yet uh, act attentive supervision and uh, uh, keep a, a plan in checking and quality control mechanism. Last slides, please. Um, so uh, again, this is an experiential learning, but in social science or in uh, uh, policy or app app application-based schools, we also tend to have projects. So I was thinking about if it's just experience, then studying abroad, internship, community, engagements are often used, but project can, can be even more flexible, right? Uh, going to historical artifacts, documentary films, foreign news, and and and, and the various uh, uh, recordings, visuals that could be built as a project-based learning. And of course, we can do simulation in both as experience and a project. And with that, I'll turn over to my uh, colleagues. That was an excellent way to get us started. Thank you so much, um, Professor Ye. Um, next up, we have a talk from Holly Schaff, who is Senior Lecturer of Writing in CAS. Dr. Schaff, please go ahead. Um, your presentation is called EL and Student Reflections, Predictions, Process, and Transfer. All right. Thank you, Erin. And I also want to, as, as Min did, thank everybody who was involved with Bridge Builders. Um, so basically, before I dive into my first slide, um, just give a wee introduction. Um, the courses that I teach in the writing program um, all involve EL. Um, I tend to most often send students out to Boston's green spaces, parks, sanctuaries. Um, but I've also sent students to museums, various cultural events, all kinds of things. Um, so basically, in all of the courses um, that I teach, I also incorporate reflection. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and so my first slide talks about um, some of the benefits of reflection just generally. Believe it or not, it's a very busy slide. There's a lot of text, but this is a very shortened list. There's way more. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about a couple of them. Um, so the first one talks about setting initial goals um, for a course, an internship, practicum, whatever the thing is um, that your students are engaging in. And this is really, really helpful and important um, because it's something students can look back on. It's something that really helps students take ownership of their learning. Another point um, that I note um, is that students can really connect their experiences through reflection to the experiences of classmates, colleagues, um, community partners, again, depending on the type of EL that they're engaging in. Um, this is something that really helps um, with you know, working relationships. Um, and then in the last little sort of chunk there of you know, some of the ways that reflection can help, students, if they're entering a professional field, can really think about their social identities, think about their past experiences and how that will impact their professional field. Um, and you might notice there's a slight space. I have sort of three you know, chunks of material here. I made it subtle. I didn't highlight specifically what each of them connect to um, because overall, um, I'm gonna talk about these three different timings for reflection, but there's overlap between all of them. So I didn't wanna sort of you know, make, it, make it sort of too um, set. Um, but um, if you advance to the next slide, um, I'll start out with pre-reflection, um, what students would do, again, at the beginning of a course or internship um, or study abroad experience. Um, and what I've done is I've shared a few questions that I used uh, in a course initially that I taught with uh, my writing program colleague, Allison Blyler, um, which was focused on Halls Pond Sanctuary in Brookline, just 10 minutes away from campus. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk briefly about each of the questions, but I'm going to talk about kind of the structure behind it um, so that you can think about how you might apply it um, to your courses. So basically the first question, um, what it does is it asks students to think about what they might see, how the experience they're going to have might feel. Um, the second question basically um, is kind of pulling in what I would call maybe a stereotype in a sense. Um, 
the fact is that oftentimes people will think, oh, in an urban setting, nature isn't there. There's this sort of polarizing sense of nature's over here, the city is not nature. Um, so with that question, um, we're sort of trying to help students to think about, hmm, wait a minute, you know, do they have these sort of preconceptions? And it will vary um, what sort of preconceptions students have. But again, you can sort of think about whatever area you're working in and hmm, what are some of the sort of preconceptions or stereotypes student might have? students might have. And it's good to not be super direct about it, but just sort of be kind of subtle. Then the third question um, is really sort of meant to elicit a listy response about categories. Here we have animals and plants, but let's say you're sending them to a museum, you could say exhibits or something like that. Final question is really asking students to think about the sort of behavior they would expect to see at an event or a site. So that's pre-reflection and that is a hooded berganser, by the way, the picture. So moving on to the next slide. Basically, this is about when a course is in progress, and I've sort of highlighted two scenarios here. The first one involves a student um, witnessing a sort of set of experiences in a sort of single observation session, and that changing how they perceived um, something. So basically, they came in thinking, oh, what's this pile of sticks? Um, why are they neglecting this space? Why aren't they making it neat? But then they actually saw you know, a rabbit and Robin use it to hide. And that helped a, a student to shape their observations all throughout the course in reading the landscape, again, through non-human eyes. Um, so basically, um, the other example that I describe is sort of more general and talks about kind of the whole process that students go through in one of my courses. Um, they're using reflection along the way with their observation notes um, to think about, hmm, you know, how, can I highlight certain patterns? What patterns might I choose for my study? They're also using it to think about how they might connect their research um, to the analysis in prior studies. And finally, they're using it to plan future observation sessions. So these are specific processes, but there's something that could transfer to a lot of different types of courses. So final slide. Basically here, what I've done is I have direct quotes uh, from some of my past students that came from a final reflective essay that they wrote. Um, first one connects to sort of general, um, you know, life skills learned. Second one has to do with sort of future education plans, but also different ways of looking at data. The third one is sort of transferring what we were doing um, basically into another subject area. And then the final one is a professional context. Basically what I tend to do is I ask students specific questions and really sort of push on the idea of, hmm, where could you apply these skills later on? And it, it helps to really sort of push that because they're usually very sort of general and vague. And so if you frame it with specific questions, it's quite helpful to get these more specific insights from students and much more helpful for students. So thank you everybody, and that's my talk. That was great, thank you so much. Um, reflection is such an important tool. Uh, it's really nice to see ways that you've incorporated it into your classes, Holly. Um, next up, um, I'm going to turn to Langdon White, uh, who is Clinical Assistant Professor of Computing and Data Sciences. Professor White, please go ahead um, with your talk on teaming for experiential learning. So uh, just to get started, you know, thank you to everybody involved. I really appreciated uh, the opportunity to work with all of you. Um, teaming is not exactly a small subject area. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so what I wanted to focus this talk on was uh, when we're doing teaming, in kind of an experiential learning context, you know, or in a classroom setting, you know, how is it maybe different or what are some tips and tricks for how you do teaming in these kinds of settings under like, you know, where most of the research is, which is on, you know, kind of industry, you know, uh, scenarios. Uh, and so, like I said, and it's only five minutes. Long, so we wanted to cover some of the content uh, quickly. So going on to the next slide. Uh, so the first thing is you want to form your teams carefully um, and you know in a sense when you are doing teams kind of in industry or in kind of in general it's often kind of haphazard right it's kind of who's available and you you know everyone kind of comes together to join a particular subject area etc 
when we're doing these things with classes, what we want to do is make sure that the teams are designed in such a way that um, we can really kind of have them focused on the project. And so we want to do things like, you know, make sure there's less freeloading than than absolutely necessary. Um, you know, and so we do things like contribution grading. So if there's a disparity between the contribution of the different teammates, can we change their grade or have the imp that impact their grade? Um, another trick we've been using is that what we often have challenges with teams is making sure that all the teams show up up to everything right especially in a in a school setting right you have all these deadlines like exams and homework and you know things like that and so working on a project over a period of time there's not a lot of deadlines in there so it's really easy for a team or students individual students to get distracted and not focus on the work and so one of the things we've instituted is actually you know weekly team meetings and then making sure they have a photo of everyone in the team and that's actually something submitted the other thing we want to do is make sure there's a diversity of perspectives on each team if we can possibly do it, you know, from socioeconomic to, you know, racial background, et cetera, because it'll actually give a better quality and it'll give them an experience of why that's so important. Um, and then another big thing that we do is try to actually engage the students in the team formation itself. So we actually try to give the uh, students um, a, like an opportunity to express their preferences regarding what projects they want to work on. So they're kind of more engaged, right? They're more involved in that individual team or that project. Um, and then the other one, which is always fun in a university setting, is the teammate schedules. You know, if we can take into account when they're free, uh, that can also make a big difference to actually making the meetings happen, et cetera. If we go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, and uh, shout out the strands here. You know, if you haven't played it, you should. Um, but uh, the other thing is that we develop these things called team agreements, uh, which uh, basically the students take a boilerplate and then they kind of fill in all these details. So, you know, what's the expected response time? What channels will we be communicating on, et cetera? Um, because uh, that that way they kind of write it down, right? And they all commit to it. In fact, we even have them print them and then sign them. So they actually have a physical engagement with the team agreement itself. Um, another interesting thing is the number of different answers you'll get to what does done mean? So I have a task and I want to do, you know, and I want to indicate that I'm done with it. Okay, well, what does that mean? You know, and if you go around in a classroom and ask them what done means, uh, it's really interesting all the different responses you get. So making sure that's in the team agreement. Um, and then another thing is like, what's the expectation around? Will there be agendas for meetings? What's the expectation of attendance? Uh, what's the notice on attendance, et cetera. So just lots of clear definitions. Landing in something we call team agreement is, is hugely beneficial. Um, and uh, going on to the next slide. And even though I'm reading the questions in the chat, I don't know if I can really cover them in the amount of time I have. Um, but so another big thing is al also we like to do uh, kind of feedback regularly throughout the semester, which hopefully has a grading impact, right? So the students take it really seriously and they understand that the feedback comes, you know, in from their teammates. We try to do 360 style, which is kind of an industry term where the teammates judge each other, but then the PMs might judge them and they judge the PMs, you know, so they call it a 360 review model. Model. Um, and then also uh, going back to the reflection comment from a minute ago, um, you know, doing retrospectives and thinking about how do we um, get better over time. So what did we do right the last, you know, week or two weeks? And what are we going to do better the next, you know, week or two weeks? And so but one big thing that I like to incorporate about the feedback is that while we do it multiple times a semester, we try to make the last ones kind of more impactful and they're great than the beginning, right? So we want them to get the feedback that says, hey, you're not participating enough, but then have an opportunity to correct for it as they uh, go through the rest of the semester. Um, and that's my talk um, because like I said, five minutes. Um, but if you wanted to learn more, strongly recommend reading the industry about it. And uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much, um, Langdon. Uh, this was great. I really benefited from it myself, having just taught my first um, course with teamwork, a huge teamwork component this semester. So thank you. Um, next up, we will be hearing from uh, Sean Keeley, who is Clinical Associate Professor at BU School of Law. Uh, Professor Keeley, I'll turn it to you to talk about EL in Law, rubrics and mock hearings. Oh, Sean, I think you're muted. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. If I could get the next slide, please. The uh, Yeah, there's many ways to do uh, experiential learning in the law school context. And in fact, it's an important part of legal training uh, recognized by the American Bar Association. Uh, so we have clinics, we have internships, we have practicums, uh, we have simulation courses. So there's uh, all sorts of things. Uh, my main clinic, the main thing that I teach is the legislative policy and drafting clinic. It's a one semester program. Uh, I typically have eight to 12 students. Uh, and the students write legislation for various clients, typically Massachusetts legislators. Uh, the entire clinic is experiential. Uh, just about everything that we do uh, touches on some aspect of EL. Uh, but I wanted to focus in on one exercise, if I could get the next slide. Uh, each semester, all of my students participate in a mock hearing up at the State House. Uh, we try very hard to replicate an actual uh, hearing where people provide testimony about bills before the legislature. And it's a chance for the uh, students to get both comments on their proposed policy, but also to work on their oral advocacy skills, uh, which, as you can imagine, is very important for lawyers. Um, the committee is comprised of senior uh, legal staff from the House and the Senate. Uh, every once in a while, we'll have a, a, a rep or a senator thrown in for good measure. But the students get four minutes to explain and advocate for their bill, and the committee questions the students for six to ten minutes. And so uh, both they can practice both having a prepared argument, uh, but also responding to questions that they aren't uh, um, they aren't given the questions in advance. Uh, next question, uh, next slide, please. And here's one of my wonderful students this semester, Josie Hamilton. Uh, she testified just a few weeks back. Uh, she's working as part of the uh, new anti-racist legislation concentration within the clinic. And her, seek, uh, her bill seeks to eliminate the felony murder rule. Uh, after the hearing, um, which is typical for all of my students in this clinic, they, she wrote a short memo reflecting on what she did well and perhaps what she could have improved upon. Uh, so speaking to, to the reflection that Holly talked about. Um, and then uh, I record the, the hearing testimony and questions. The students have a chance to take a look at it. And then um, uh, write up this memo and then we'll discuss it as well so I can give my feedback. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, but this is going to change next semester um, and it, it'll it happen for a couple of different reasons. Um, in a year or so, a team from the American Bar Association will conduct a, a thorough review of the law school and our program uh, for accreditation purposes. Uh, I'm, of course, going to keep the uh, reflective memo uh, because it's so very important, but the ABA and the law school wants to see evidence that our students are being trained in several key skills, including oral advocacy. Uh, and so our first year lawyering faculty developed a very extensive rubric, far more extensive than what you see here, uh, to evaluate their trial argument exercise that all law students do in their second semester. But just recently, I adopted their rubric for my mock hearing, and uh, I plan to use this rubric at the next hearing in October. Uh, I also plan to have the committee members themselves assess the students with the rubric, uh, so I can get a couple of different perspectives, especially you know perspectives from those people who aren't working with the students all the time. Uh, and as a member of the outcomes and assessment committee uh, for the law school, um, we're one of the committees preparing for this ABA visit coming up. Um, we are very interested in having data to uh, show the ABA, but also to reflect on as a law school to see if we're doing our job training lawyers in oral advocacy. Uh, and so we're going to be uh, asking all upper level classes to use some form of a rubric so we can gather that data um, uh, both for the visit and for our own our own information. Uh, and of course, one of the things that we've done is, is look at the rubric and we've identified some issues of that need to be worked out a little better. Um, we perhaps need to better describe the value to differentiate between a two and a three or a three and a four. 
we have to ask what the baseline is. That is what skill level uh, should a student be at at this point in their legal training. Um, we're asking whether the student should see these scores or if they should be interpreted by the instructor and then discussed with the student. And then a larger issue, do we as a law school do enough to foster oral advocacy and should we be putting more resources into it? Um, hopefully other courses that include oral advocacy will begin to use these rubrics and we'll uh, have the data that we need to evaluate how we're doing as a law school training students for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Sean. That was uh, great for us to think about evaluation and rubrics um, as we incorporate EL in various ways. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to turn finally uh, to Max Greenberg, uh, who is Senior Lecturer of Sociology in CAS. Uh, Dr. Bre Greenberg, please go ahead with your talk on partnerships for experiential learning. Great. Um, thanks, everyone. And thanks to the bridge builders. Um, it was a really great opportunity for me to think through a, a new uh, model that, that we're trying out in sociology, and, and I'll get to that in a minute. So I'm going to talk about partnerships. And a partnership is a formalized and mutually beneficial, meaning it's good for you and good for the partner, um, relationship between uh, a university group, a course, a class, and an outside entity. That could be a business, community organization, government agency. And you know the way I see it is that partnerships are really distinct because they're fundamentally about this dialogue between the academic context and this external setting um, that has its own sort of distinct set of practices, rules, norms, and that students uh, learn a sort of particular set of, of ways by going back and forth between them. So it's I see this different from uh, other kinds of experiential learning where you're going to an outside place, but sort of purely within the academic context, uh, or if you're just in an internship, but actually the back and forth makes it really useful. Um, and students sort of, uh, we think sociologically about this all the time, that different institutions have different sets of rules and norms and cultural systems. And, and by going back and forth, students really get to see that. So what are partnerships good for? Um, you know, first expanding horizons. And, and by that, I mean, there's some things that students, uh, you know, just can't learn the same way when they're in a classroom setting that getting outside the classroom uh, often leads to uh, exciting uh, moments uh, of intellectual or creative or social sort of um, collision and, and the the I, these different worlds of the academic world and the institution or the, the group they're working with bump together and that can sort of create new ideas and expand horizons. Um, uh, of course, it's good for practicing skills, um, but practicing skills outside of the academic context where the consequences are different, they're sort of more naturally occurring, right? So instead of, uh, if you struggle with a skill, instead of getting a bad grade, you struggle with a skill, maybe you see the consequences in terms of the output, uh, maybe you let somebody down, uh, or, you know, the flip side, you, you really thrive, you get that sort of uh, clear natural consequence, that clear feedback, and it's sort of a, a really meaningful thing in partnerships. And then lastly, obviously connecting students with individuals, with organizations, so they can build those ties that will help them uh, whenever they do when they leave uh, BU, right? So if that's um, connecting with student, uh, connecting uh, with organizations, individuals, whatever that may be. Um, go ahead on to the next slide. Um, so what makes a uh, what does a good partnership look like? Um, or sorry, what, what are what could partnership look like? Sorry, um, they can be uh, community or project based. So that's usually designing, developing, constructing solutions to problems uh, with a goal defined by the client. So that's really um, external goals. Uh, they can be uh, a practicum, which is applying a set of skills in a field setting. So those are skill focused. Uh, service learning, which is uh, more about the needs of a particular community uh, or can be an internship. Uh, and here I say internship with coursework um, where uh, this is a model that we've been working on. And I'll say a little bit more about where we pair um, a sort of classic internship where you're getting work experience with a parallel track of coursework, thinking in, and applying ideas from a discipline to the course. Uh, and then lastly, I say here, anything you can dream up because I think there's a lot of potential here to be creative and do something uh, dynamic. And I think, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing, and I, and I hope you all think about ways you can do that too. You can go ahead to the, the next slide. Um, so how to prepare for a partnership. So a partnership is really three points. Um, there's you, 
there's the partner and there's the students. And our goal uh, is to connect those three points and make a triangle. So you want to be thinking about the ways that you can cultivate each of those sets of connections. It's three distinct kinds of connections. Um, so you, you want to sort of think about how you're setting up those connections, how you're um, you know, solidifying them in terms of maybe a, a contract or an agreement, how you're arranging expectations, logistics, all those things. So, so here I go through each of those sort of connections. First, you work with the partners to set expectations and plan logistics. So that's the connection between you as sort of a representative of the course and um, the partner, uh, right? And uh, that might be a, a course agreement. It might be setting expectations about how often you're going to email, whatever it may be. Uh, then you want to bring the students in and sort of align the students and the partners, have them on the same page for how they're going to be talking to each other, how they're going to be uh, communicating, what the expectations are, the deadlines, all those things. And then you want to set up your relationship with the student uh, around their work, uh, which is one of the mechanisms for feedback and accountability. How are they going to be hearing from you uh, to see how, how they're doing, how they're moving forward, uh, and uh and sort of how you're going to do that. So those are the sort of three sides to the triangle as we think about it. There's going to be a lot, a lot of details in, in the FAQ we put together. Um, but I want to talk briefly about how we approach this for uh, SO499, which is a, a new course. It's an internship and fieldwork practicum. Um, and basically, we've been working with, with Aaron at The Connector to design this new internship course. And it's a split course. So uh, they'll be doing an internship uh, often with a nonprofit, but then they'll also be doing a course where they're um, learning about applying fieldwork sociological methods. So as I'm preparing for this, I'm thinking about uh, the partners are going to be varied. So I want to have a short set of connections. Um, and I'm going to have a, I'm going to try to tailor specifically to um, the kinds of approaches we have in the class. And you all will want to think about how to do that similarly. Um, my time's up, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap there. Thank you so much, Max. I'm really excited to see SO499 come to fruition next semester. Um, thank you all. Um, we've got some questions in the chat, and I jotted down a couple of questions of my own um, to ask folks. Um, I'd like to to start um, focusing on this idea of sort of evaluation or kind of the feedback that students receive um, from us as instructors, but also from um, external entities that um, that they might be partnering with um, in experiential learning. Um, so I'm actually going to turn that to Min first, if I could. Um, Min, you talked, you gave us such a nice overview of the different ways that EL can be incorporated into courses from from very short term to semester long um, to practica. Um, can you talk about um, how evaluation of the student is incorporated into those three different um, types of, um, of EL in courses? Well, uh, thanks, Erin. Um, so I, 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 uh, I usually have like three stages uh, without listening to Holly's first about it, it's kind of um so so uh so so I have uh in the beginning of the of the project I, I talk to students you know why they uh how they think about the task a bit for for the project uh like the uh, policy application project like how you deal with uh, delivery to the rural community uh, 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 the, uh, 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 some kind of welfare program, uh, or how do you um, uh, implement the special economic zone policies in India? So th these are issues that I address in, in class and by, uh, I allow students to, to choose whichever they want to do. Uh, and so there's a beginning uh, initial conversation and see how they thought about the issue, how they plan. And then at the middle, one third of the time, I will inquire them in class. And two thirds of the time, there will be a written uh, feedback and you know, the checking on the stage and issue that they run into. And, and of course, then there's a final. You know, after they submitted the project, then there's a final uh, uh, relatively official review of their experience, you know, what, what, how much they learned. 
excellent or middle educated or poor. Uh, and because if the team, then there's team evaluation. Um, so so I I I I keep uh, pretty um, hands on uh, hands off and hands on, and so I uh, give them a lot of flexibility. But I do want them to to reflect and justify their choices uh, frequently. Great, thanks so much. Um, I'm I'm Holly. I would love to hear about how you evaluate and grade student reflections, which are inherently so, you know, kind of supposed to come off the cuff from, you know, um, as they're experiencing it. How do you incorporate grading and evaluation into, into the feedback you give? I, I okay. <laughs> basically feedback um, is kind of the name of the game. I tend to um, treat reflections. I don't give them letter grades. Um, I tend to give credit um, for completion. Obviously, in the rare case, if, if it, a student didn't, if there was a sense they weren't really kind of, you know, thinking about the issues, you know, they wouldn't get credit. But that happens extraordinarily rarely. Because I think if you frame reflections in such a way that um, you're giving students different sort of jumping off points, and you're giving students a clear sense of, um, how the reflections can be, you know, helpful to them, like I said, kind of initially at the beginning of a course, or helpful for them in terms of um, completing other assignments successfully, or helpful to them in terms of, wait, actually, you know, not reducing a course to just a sort of this, this singular entity that, well, we sit in this classroom and we learn a bunch of stuff or, you know, whatever, and then, you know, it's over and we get a final grade and yeah, I mean, maybe some of it's useful, but really helping them to get used to paying attention to, hmm, how could I actually, you know, transfer this skill, even again, in course, in, in using my course as an example, even if they never write about wildlife behavior again, um, thinking about what were the skills I needed to do that, that can actually transfer um, to my future contexts, um, they're able to really get a lot out of it individually. Um, but it's also the case that um, depending on how personal the reflections are, sometimes they can get someone per somewhat personal in that case. I don't tend to do kind of class discussions, um, but for some of them, it's really, really helpful. Um, for example, um, like the pre-reflection questions I showed, often um, I'll then incorporate that into a class discussion that we have actually after we do the visit. Uh, and they get to talk about, oh, you know, I thought it would be like this, but then, oh, their classmate thought it would be like that. And we get to really then take a step back um, and see, hmm, well, what, what are the patterns that we actually see in terms of how the students, um, you know, were reflecting beforehand. And so I think personally for me, I feel like it's about actually selling reflection as a tool that can be really helpful for students. And to me, EL makes that easier because already we're, you know, as, as Max mentioned, he used like the phrase social collision. We're in a more direct and intense way um, showing students that the class goes in a sense beyond the walls of the classroom, or we can look at it in the opposite way that things that you pick up in this class already are applying beyond, again, these just sort of four walls. Um, so to me, it's, you know, I, I would be very resistant to applying letter grades to students' reflections, because to me, that's sort of sending the wrong message. The message is really giving them a sense of how useful these things can be. And most of the time when you do that with most students, they then do a really wonderful job on them. And they really do think about things and treasure that opportunity. Thanks for the question. Oh, sure, Holly. And just to follow up on that, um, Margot Miller has asked um, just for specifics about how much your students already know about Hall's Pond Sanctuary before they make their predictions and do that pre-flexion. Pre well, well, in most cases, um, I actually like to um, not share too much initially um, and uh, let the students kind of, you know, go off their own expectations. Now, this is an example, though, of something that you can't control. Often there will be a student or two that maybe they've happened to already visit Hall's Pond, or there will be a student that can't resist Googling it because they do feel a little nervous, even if I try to emphasize, well, no, this is just about, you know, your, your thoughts. It's not you predicted right or you predicted wrong. Um, but typically most of the students, you know, write, 
a pre-reflection, respond to those types of questions without much knowledge. And we do the visit um, with just a little bit of information um, beforehand, because I like to actually have them go in somewhat fresh so that they can appreciate the actual experience from their perspective. And then, as I mentioned, oftentimes it's after an initial visit that then we have a group discussion. And then in context, um, we'll talk, you know, more about the history of the sanctuary. We'll talk more about, oh, so you guys, you know, you saw the great blue heron, um, you know, or you saw this particular uh, species or you, you noticed this trend in the landscape. Um, and then we use what they actually saw as a jumping off point um, for more context. And then typically they will go back then both with the initial visit and then the context that we discuss in class and kind of think about, hmm, how have the, have their perspectives shifted, um, both from their own reflections, but also from talking with classmates and also from the additional context they've now gotten about a site. Thanks so much, Holly. Um, I'm going to move to Langdon and um, we're getting a couple questions about um, teamwork um, and I'm going to go to this this last question that just came in um, in the chat. Um, that you brought up the term freeloading um, in term in team among team members. I will say it is something that I might have witnessed this semester and in my course that focuses on teamwork. Um, what tools um, are do you use for regulating free freeloading in the team um, or over the course of the semester? Uh, the commuter rail says hello. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I was actually starting to type a response to the question. And uh, the, the short answer is um, that's probably a subject of an entire uh, presentation in and of itself, uh, if not multiple. Um, so one of the things we've been experimenting with, um, and so one thing that we've done for kind of a long time is uh, kind of to halt. Uh, to talking about the feedback, right? It's like, you know, uh, basically getting students to give feedback on each other and then sharing that result with the student um, has been interesting. Um, you know, there's kind of like we, you know, we have a bunch of different instructors who teach different classes in Spark and we kind of uh, do slightly different things. Like, you know, in some of the classes we're more comfortable with actually sharing kind of most of the feedback, even if it's not uh, you know, it's anonymized, but, you know, actually kind of giving the the content of the feedback. Other times, uh, you know, sometimes we'll also share just kind of the score of the feedback. Um, and so one of the things that I usually do is you try to find an arbitrary number like 737. Um, and, you know, no matter what team allocation, now give everyone points. Um, based on their contribution factor. Um, and the the weird number makes it so they really have to actually think about it. They can't, you can't give them, you know, if it's a four person team, 400, everybody gets a hundred, you're done, right? Um, if you give them kind of a weird number that's not related to the team size, um, that makes them think about it a little bit more. And you can kind of incorporate that score by either giving the feedback to the students directly. Another way to do it is actually incorporate that kind of in the grading, kind of like I was talking about a little bit before. The other thing that we've also been doing uh, lately in one of my classes is um, that, you know, it, you know, generally speaking, a project is graded at the project level, right, or at the group level. So what we do is we determine that grade, let's say it's a B plus, um, and then based on the, as determined by us, the contribution made by each teammate, it can have a positive or negative effect on that grade. Um, and, you know, speaking as a programmer, I talk about the, the Y position. So like plus minus or, or no, neither, right? Um, so basically if there's a 10% difference in the contribution, it's gonna have a positive or negative effect. Uh, you know, so you went from a B to a B plus, because you had a really high contribution because there's a 10% differential. But the students can also kind of come and argue the position in advance. So in other words, if, if the team has determined that like, hey, we, we look like we didn't contribute evenly, um, so we want to explain how we did actually contribute evenly. Um, so that has also been really interesting. Um, and then um, the other thing that I, I think also makes a big difference is those, and I kind of talked about it in the chat, is those, those weekly reports or sprint reports or whatever, where everyone kind of needs to contribute what they did over the past week, right? And if you have nothing to say, if you have nothing to show, it's going to be really obvious really early on. Um, so 
those are some of the tips that we have. Um, you know, again, this is a, a subject of much uh, research. Um, you know, what I found actually, I, I went and did uh, towards the beginning of the semester, I went and did like another perusal of kind of like maybe somebody's solved this by now. And no. Um, so, you know, but there, that's kind of some of the ideas we've been having. Um, they, I think they work pretty well. Um, and obviously, I can get into more detail if anyone's interested. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to um, Shaw and Noel for, the, for that question. I want to move to a question from Eric Jarvis right now. And I think that um, that Sean Keeley and Max Greenberg, um, your your talks um, and your expertise could really um, provide some uh, a nice uh, response to this. I'll read the question. Eric uh, writes, I was wondering what kinds of framing explanation you provide to students at the outset to set up your EL experiences and to, and to prepare students to be successful with them. Is there anything you have found to be important to discuss or stress at the beginning of the experience, either to create the conditions for success or to mitigate against possible challenges? Um, and, you know, Sean, I think, you know, I'm thinking about those students walking into that mock trial scenario for the first time, you know, how, how the heck do you get them ready for that um, in a way to inspire confidence, but also to let them know that, you know, or let them experience it as they as they would in a real life scenario? Yeah, it, it's, it's a great question, because uh, the mock hearing is a very different experience from doing a mock trial or doing a mock argument that's court based. Uh, there's more people, the questions are different, they're posed at different times, uh, there's a different tone and tenor. Uh, and it's something that, you know, everybody has seen some court proceeding on TV, but legislative hearings are a lot more rare in popular media. So we actually have a class several weeks before the mock hearing where uh, uh, I discuss, you know, elements of a good testimony. We talk about what the legislators need to get out of the testimony, what they hope, what I hope they will get out of the questions and, and uh, commentary. Um, but how to structure a very short presentation, like uh, four minutes that goes by very quickly, uh, and uh, what to anticipate about the questions. And so hope, and then we watch a couple of uh, real life testimonies uh, take place. Um, so it, it, as far as the framing goes, uh, you know, I talked to them about how how it's very natural to be nervous beforehand. Of course, that's part of any public speaking, uh, but that this is something different and it's something that you have to experience and you have to work at in order to get better at it. Uh, and it's it's such a great opportunity for them to to have it in a controlled environment where they get to reflect on it where they get to think about what they could have done better uh and and going forward how to improve so that's really the framing that i put into place thanks so much sean um and max i i imagine that you know for students who are engaging in these community partnerships for the first time there's there's some um work that you do with them to get ready to engage with the partner in ways that um, align with the partner's expectations. Can you talk about, about that? Yeah, I think, um, so I'll, I'll say sort of broadly, I think, yeah, the key is uh, being clear about learning objectives. Uh, in our particular case, the learning objectives run sort of parallel to the, uh, the partner objectives uh, because students are going to be applying a set of field work methods. So participant observation, maybe interviews to try to answer sociological questions while they're also doing their internship. So it's a sort of two parallel track approach, which is going to look different from what a lot of folks do. And um, I think, you know, everyone, uh, depending on where you're doing experiential learning, um, your learning objectives are going to be different. And you just have to be very clear about those with students. And, and for us, it's sort of clarifying that they're doing two sort of things at the same time. And that putting those things into conversation is a lot of what we're trying to do. So, uh, you know, I'll um, lay out the learning objectives for, for them. I'll also give them models of field work uh, to look at um, and talk through my own experiences doing similar field work. Well, um, thank you so much. Um, I know there were a couple questions that we um, that we didn't get to touch on, but hopefully we can um, connect you all for some follow up. Um, I think we're going to sort of move to to the uh, concluding remarks now. So I, I don't know if you can bring up those last slides, Etienne. 
Um, I want to uh, just begin by thanking everybody um, and our speakers for this really um, informative and exciting discussion. Um, and I, I also wanted to um, share a bit of information about the CAS um, Experiential Learning Connector. Um, I put our website um, and other contact information in this slide. Um, as I noted, we're primarily a resource for CAS undergraduates, helping them find and access EL opportunities on campus. Next slide, please. Um, this is sort of three things that we focus on. Um, we focus on giving students the opportunity to explore their interests by finding relevant ways to engage in EL. Um, you know, as uh, Holly talked about, we, you know, the importance of reflection. So we work with students um, who have engaged or are engaging in EL experiences um, to reflect on what they're learning um, and what they've done through these experiences um, so they can begin to see how they're developing um, personally, professionally, academically. Um, and then we work with students to connect um, with other folks who um, have similar interests to expand their network of support and to find future to find future EL opportunities. Next slide, please. Um, so we welcome you to refer your students to us if they've had a great EL experience in your course and they're looking to find other experiential learning, we can help them do that. Um, in addition to a robust listing of EL opportunities and courses available on our website, we also want, run four unique programs that are designed to help students maximize their EL experiences. Some of these programs provide funding for um, off-campus internships. Others provide mentorship and guidance for students seeking new ways to find and engage with EL. And finally, next slide, please. Um, for all of you, I'd like to mention um, to the CAS faculty in the Zoom room that the connector um, has recently taken over the administration of the Virginia Sapiro Academic Enhancement Fund. Um, and this fund is set up um, to give funding to instructor instructors who are seeking to pilot EL activities or projects in your classes. Um, the enhancement fund, academic enhancement fund is now accepting applications for fall 2024 courses. So if you heard anything from the speakers today that inspired you to incorporate EL in your courses, you can apply um, for funding to do so um, through the AEF. Um, and I uh, welcome you to apply or to reach out to me with any questions. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ben. Thank you, Aaron. And um... Thank you to all of our presenters, uh, Min, Langdon, Max, Holly, and Sean. Um, if you'd like to continue the conversation, we're having a hub and pub on Thursday from four to six at the BU pub. I put the registration link in the chat. Um, we can talk about things related to the hub, but we're also very happy to talk about things related to experiential learning or related to teaching in general at BU. Um, before we end, I wanted to give one more acknowledgement to the Davis Educational Foundation, that, and, uh, which was a key funder or the funder uh, for the Bridge Builders program. Um, and I want to say that this lightning talk will be posted on the CTL and DLNI websites in a couple weeks. Finally, um, a survey is coming. Um, we'd love you to take a chance, take a, a few minutes just to um, tell us uh, what you liked and didn't like so much about this event. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Ben.